Happy Friday and welcome to another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of this great country. Now, over the course of this episode, we'll be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone who lives there. Today, we are honored to be sitting down with a region of Waterloo Regional Councillor, Colleen James. But before we jump into that interview, we would like to take a moment and say we couldn't embark on this journey without your support. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please consider visiting our support page, conveniently linked in the show notes, or by visiting crossborderinterviews.ca and clicking on the support page. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can keep delivering the kind of content that you have come to expect from us. Now, on to our interview with Regional Councillor Colleen James. Councillor James, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. It's always great to have municipal leaders from across Canada who are passionate about talking about themselves, but also talking about their communities. But I want to start with my first question that I've asked every single municipal leader who's ever come on the show, so you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve come from? Oh, my goodness. So great question. And thank you for having me on the show, Chris. Uh, you know, I think the duty to serve the community has always been a part of me, like a fabric of who I am from, you know, the work experience that I had growing up in the community, um, uh, volunteering, all of the things. But as of late, uh, and I should say, you may ask me this at some point, but I spent many of my years working in municipal government. Um, but as of late with, you know, 2020. To and, and recognizing that there was an election coming up and I thought, you know, um, the community has changed dramatically in the region of Waterloo and um, the ways in which uh, we're making decisions, how the informed decisions, I said, you know, I've been doing the work in community for so long, it's time to be at uh, at a decision-making table where we're really making decisions, not just about right now, but into the future. And, you know, like some of your other past uh, guests, I do have a young family and, um, and I really want to make sure that the decisions we're making are, are really paying attention to what the needs and future needs of, of our, our younger generations are in, in this community that's growing astronomically. You, you you talk about deciding uh, why you want to get involved, but I want to talk about who you are for a little bit here for a yeah. second before we actually get involved into the 2022 election and why you decided that was the time to put your name forward. Growing up, I have to ask the question, did you ever think to yourself, I'm going to be a politician one day? Uh, so I'm probably one of the only ones who will say yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, because I think what you asked before, you know, I've done volunteering with, um, you know, community organizations, and I love politics. Like I always have, I've always recognized the importance of um that governing body at various levels. So for me, and I mean, you could probably ask many people who grew up with me uh, when I decided to run. They said we knew this was coming. So, um. I, I always I just knew that at some point I was going to run. It was just a matter of when and where, essentially. Um, but again, you know, being focused and so grounded in community, I, I recognize that you know, being being a part of the conversations and making the decisions is is so important. You, but yes, you... I always knew. I always knew I was going to run. <laughs> <laughs> You've openly admitted it's on your biography on the region of Waterloo's website that you worked in municipal government prior to entering into municipal elected politics. Um, was municipal where it was for you? Was it was it the allure of the local government that drew you to the municipal level? Or what was the decision about getting behind into the administration side and then getting into the elected side of municipal government? Yeah, so I'll, I'll say this, especially as some of you are watching. So I, um, many years ago, worked uh, for the province in the 
former a former premier's office. Uh, won't date uh, date myself here. Um, so I got that. Um, oh come I on, let's date. Let's insight. date ourselves here. Let's date ourselves because <laughs> I've dated myself by saying I worked in the McGuinty government. So I need to know from you. She's really young. So so many years ago, for former Premier Mike Harris, I was one okay. of his media analysts. So okay, um, I got a little bit of my feet wet there. Um, but the working in municipal governments, so, you know, so you know that time time came and went um and then i ended up many years later working for the city of waterloo so i understood the, the provincial aspect and the role that the province was was very uh um uh, siloed i guess into one aspect but the city of waterloo gave me that insight into really being kind of the closest to community which many many will say but also understanding the needs how the needs are changing so I worked at the city of Waterloo. Um, I supported the mayor. So I worked out of the mayor's office there and um, uh, spent a term in, in a little bit with um, the mayor, Brenda Halloran at the time, uh, and then left and went to the region. So I had this municipal, you know, city of Waterloo perspective. And then I went to work at the region. And then I saw kind of, the impact and the decisions that were being made across the whole entire area. Um, multiple cities, townships, development, growth, planning, um, again, just in the services, right? We're 60% service-based here and how, just how everything is connected. And I actually, I mean, I just, I, I loved this aspect. So the municipal, but in particular, the regional level, where it was just, you know, these are the services that we're providing for people. Um, there's, you know, seeing again the needs, seeing how the the needs are changing, and then recognizing for me that, you know, uh, what happens sometimes is we've got people who've been in positions for many, many, many years, and it's almost like they're not really in tune with exactly how the community is changing. And that's where I said, okay, you know, um um let's see if we can we can make more reflective decisions of our communities and but the region and municipal politics is uh i would say years ago if you would have asked me this question i would have said no be you know be a provincial or federal but you know once i was uh working at this level and understanding exactly how important it is and how it's directly tied to community I said, I'm going to, you know, this is where I want to be for now. Anyways, <laughs> <laughs> Go, <spicy. laughs> um, I, I want to talk about the decision now, because you wake up one day and you say, okay, this is the time. This is Colleen's mm -hmm. time that I'm going to put my name forward. Now there's a lot of different things that come into play when you're looking at running, particularly in Ontario, because I don't think a lot of people outside the province understand that there's two tiers of government municipally, there's regional and then there's the local. Now, correct me if I'm wrong here, uh, Colleen, but you're from Kitchener, but you yeah. decide to run for the region. So talk me through the process of being your first election. You're going to put your name forward for the regional level compared to sort of the, and I say, hate to say local level because it is a true level of government, but the yeah. uh, the community uh, level compared to the regional level. Yeah, it, it really comes down to, I, I mean, first, you know, I mean, it is a big decision. And, um, you know, I, I didn't even really consider this the city level i i because working at the region and understanding the scope and the magnitude we're talking roads we're talking infrastructure we're talking and again these are things as you alluded to people have no idea who does what you know um but when you really understand who does what and the the direct impact people depend on the services you recognize Okay, if we're going to talk about transit and expanding transit, um, making sure we're getting to people, we're building communities out, you know, it's important to be there. Um, things like our, our, you know, from a public health perspective, from community, from housing even, you know, um, 
all of all of the the big things or the things that people don't even think about think about waste collection right garbage collection um, <laughs> I say this because I'm chair of planning and works. And so even myself now, um, you know, the impact that, you know, these things have on, on communities and they have no idea who does what, but it's like, my thing is about how do we make our services more efficient? It, it, some people, it doesn't even matter if you know who does what, as long as you get what you need. So, um, you know, why do you think that is? I, I apologize to interrupt here, but you've just opened up a, a line of questioning that I love to talk about. There is yeah. an apathy in this country about the levels of jurisdictional rules and regulations that different levels of government have to deal with. At the end of the day, the average resident, I, I hate painting a broad stroke here, but I think I need to on this question. The average resident doesn't care. As long as their garbage is picked up, like you said, their water turns on and they get to their from point A to point B in a good, timely fashion, they're happy. Why do you yeah. think that there is a more apathetic nature when it comes to regional and even local governance in Canada? Oh, gosh, that's a big question. I mean, there's so many factors with this. You know, there's a stigma around politicians, right? <laughs> you don't and, say. <laughs> and lack of trust. The way we communicate Um you know, there's there's so many dynamics. And first and foremost, I think, you know, when you've got multiple levels, like two tiers here, these they, they're designed to be confusing. So nobody can really know who does what. And there's an accountability piece that, you know, is avoided in a sense too, you know? But the 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 apathy around it, again, I think um part of it too, you know, the other levels are, are partisan, so people can align themselves. This year, you're independently running, and I wish, I really wish people understood more just how important, I think in some cases, even more important it is to, to even be involved at the local level, because this is, this is your tax dollars directly at work. <laughs> So you just came off almost a year ago to the, literally the month when this airs, um, a win municipally. When you were going out door knocking in that in 2022, that election, what issues were on top of people's minds? Were they along the same lines of apathy? Were they more regional issues or were they a gambit of provincial, federal, local issues? And you as the candidate have to try to address them, but try to tell them that you have to sort of play teacher in some sense to say, I, I would love to answer that question, but that's a provincial issue. Uh, yes, we have to deal with it, but uh, that is for your MPP or your MP who's federal or even your city councillor for Kitchener. Yeah, um, most top of mind at the door was, um, you know, housing, affordable housing, attainable housing, and, uh, you know, our homelessness. Uh, because at the top of mind for everybody was, you know, affordability. And we do have a homelessness crisis, I do believe, in this in this country and province. So, um, you know, that was top of mind. A lot of people were at with that. A lot of people didn't vote um, and had not voted. So a lot of the education at the door was telling people, you know, this is, the minute you turn on your water, you know, that has to come from somewhere and how important it is and how as much as they don't think government and our decisions impact them, it absolutely does. Um, uh, a lot of conversation too around transportation, around, uh, especially when I go outside, I went outside of the core of the, the city into the suburbs and, and, you know, the lack of transportation, public transportation options, uh, one of the biggest things is uh, we know across this province is around taxes and, and um, you know, at the time, I think they were projecting a 10% uh, tax increase. So people were really conscious of how are we going to afford this? So again, education around the services, the demand for services and having to um, fill in gaps where the province, you know, downloaded things onto us and we're trying to supplement uh, the fee for that. You know, the, the interesting thing with knocking on the door is you hear a lot from community about all different types of things. And the best advice I ever got, to so put it out there, is assume that 90% of the people don't know who you are. So you're connecting with people that you, you know, would not otherwise meet. 
Now you, you've been in the position for a year now, and now you've been on the other side of the table, the council table being an administrative role. And now you've been on the council side of the table, uh, actually making the decisions. What's been the biggest eye-opening learning curve for you being on that other side of that council table, being an actual city, a regional councillor and making the decisions? I think recognizing just how extra layered and nuanced things can be. So when you think about things like, um, you know, you're factoring in legal implication, you're factoring in resources, um, you know, it's been, it's, and the other thing too is really having to understand the municipal act and the legislative ways we're bound by things, you know, uh, that to me has been completely eye-opening, especially as we get into things like budget and what we are legislatively, like we have to do, mandated to do. And and um, when we have people who are saying, just do this thing, just, just change this. And it's like, but it's not that simple, you know? Um, the other thing I will say is uh, as an employee, you know, you work your nine to five and you can kind of shut down. Um, you know, in this role, you're kind of on all the time. Anything can come out, up at any given time. And sometimes we have really long meetings, Chris, like 12 hours we're sitting here some days. So um, just that, the amount of uh, uh, extra a, a, a time and, and investment that it takes. But education-wise, I'm always learning about the legislation and what we're bound by and saying, okay, so now I understand even more so why there's that much of a barrier to change something or to do something differently. Now, we, we've openly talked about how municipal and even regional governments are the closest to the people. The decisions you make are going to impact the residents of your communities the next day. The moment yeah. you make them, they're getting impacted. Pro province, it takes a while. Federal, it even takes a little bit longer. But municipally, it's where you make the biggest impact. Now, that can weigh on people. That can weigh because the decisions you make are going to negatively or potentially impact your residents and even your family members, your friends on a day-to-day -day basis. How much weight mm. do you put on yourself to make sure you're doing it right? Oh, my goodness. Big question. It's something that I think I will continuously be trying to balance. One of the things that I was very conscious about as I ran was about, you know, really having informed conversations with community. So, you know, for me, it's, um, we're not going to please everyone. I'm not going to please everyone. Some of the decisions may go against, um, again, sometimes there's other things to factor in, but I really try and have as much informed conversations with the public as I can. Um, and that helps. E and even if there is a disagreement or, you know, of, of a way to approach something, at least knowing that the conversation's been there and and I've had that, it helps to for me to make more informed decisions. But I also think on the other side with the public, I'm informing them of process as well. So um, but it's something you continuously struggle with because, you know, you're going to pave a road and make it widened and add bicycle lanes. And some people love bicycle lanes and some people don't. And, you know, the other thing I think about too is the decisions I'm making. It's not just for right now and today, it's for 10 years down the road. It's for 15 years down the road. So that helps me sometimes with, with balancing that when, when, when there may be a disconnect or, or, or something about a decision. Is there a balancing act when it comes to the people of Kitchener with the people of the region? Because you're elected as a regional representative for Waterloo, but, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I believe if I'm not mistaken, there are wards in the regional region of Waterloo. So you're there, to, you're, you're elected by the people of your ward, which would be Kitchener, but yeah. you're not just there to represent them. You're representing all of the region. So yeah. is there a balancing act when it comes to that aspect of the job as well? Because sometimes the decisions that you're making are not going to impact your residents and they might say, well, we're not getting our fair share, but then you have to go back and say, yeah, you are. It's just, we have to look at it as a region and not just as a individual issue. Yeah. And I think where, you know, there's benefit of having representatives from say the townships that are sitting at regional council table and, and listening to that perspective. 
perspective and what they may be bringing to the table. But, uh, you know, the other thing, too, is I ran knowing that I'd be making decisions about the entire region. So there is a little bit of a sense of duty as well to pay attention to what's happening outside of Kitchener. Um, and, and you know, and when I was campaigning and, and people were saying we can't vote for you, but at the same time, I'd say, but I do still represent you because there is a vote that uh, I do bring a vote across the whole entire region. So um, uh, it's something that that is I, I think some people recognize that. Um, but for me, it's it's you know, it's the entire region. So I look at the decisions for the entire region. Now, we're going to talk about the issues here in a few seconds, but I have one last question, and you've already have alluded to it a little bit in an earlier statement, but I want to dive into it a little bit more if possible. How do you balance personal life and a counselor's life in a region? Because you, you're right. You you probably don't get paid a lot of money. You not you're, It's a, a part-time job, I'm assuming, but you are on 24-7. You have to be aware that if you go out in the public, you are a regional counselor. If you go to an event, people are going to come talk to you. If you go to the grocery store, there may be people who come up and talk to you. Yes. You, you you have a family, you have a, uh, a child, you have a husband. I'm assuming hmm. family life is important to you. So how do you balance the life of a regional counselor with family life? Oh my goodness. I wish I could tell you what the answer is to that. It is really being purposeful to just shut down sometimes. I, uh, I am a homebody at times, but, uh, you know, I think, I think it's something that, um, you know, I'm not isolated with this at all, uh, but yeah, it makes like going to the grocery store can be challenging. You know, I've had people stop me in the grocery store. I'm very conscious too of, of, you know, bringing my my daughter out a lot because, you know, it's uh, in trying to protect that little bit of privacy that I do have with my family. Um, but it, it's a balance. I wish I could tell you this is how I navigate it. Uh, maybe at the end of these first four years, I'll tell you what the secret is. But, you know, I'm very purposeful of when I need to take downtime and, and not be, you know, public facing that is where, you know, it's it's sometimes the only way you can turn off is when you actually leave the region, um, you know, and, and you're not all on all the time. Even things like social media and, you know, you tweet something and you don't know if it's going to be in the next news article, you know, so it is and it is a part time role, um, you know, so there's also that there's a part time role, but there's a 24 seven demand on you. Um, from the public. So I, I think I knew that this would probably be like this going into it, but um, it's something that I think all of us struggle with, uh, especially if we have young families. Does, mom, does, does your daughter know what mom does? Does your daughter know that, okay, if I'm going to the grocery store with mom, I'm going to be probably a half hour longer and maybe I can get like a free snack or a free toy out of it because I had to wait. And <laughs> <get mom. laughs> She knows. She absolutely does recognize that. Similar if I'm on the phone call, she'll come and ask for the snack. But she knows what I do. And, um, you know, we were very, we had the, the family discussion about all this. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, sometimes she gets it, sometimes she doesn't. And she, she's like, oh, you got to go to those meetings. But, you know, I always tell her what I'm doing is for her. So, um, but, uh, she's a good, she's a good sport about it. Um, um, but she, she's, she's aware. She definitely knows. <laughs> so I, wa I want to turn to the region of Waterloo as a whole now. And before I ask this question, I'm going to preface it by saying, this is a conversation between the counselor and myself. This is not a motion okay. of counsel. This is not a direction of counsel. This is not a policy at counsel. We seem to get emails whenever I ask this question. Not often, but we do get them. This is her opinion. So, Counselor James, in your opinion, as of recording this episode, what are the biggest issues or issue facing the region of Waterloo today? Oh, my goodness. The biggest issue right now is, um, and I think because it's top of mind for me, is just what our overall budget, how are we going to pay for the increased demand for the services that we are providing? 
And how do we do this in a way where we're not putting that burden on taxpayers even more? Um, I would also say that this, the other thing equally is our, our um, affordable housing uh crisis that we have it's not just the building homes because we can build homes but what i'm hearing is how do we make these homes affordable for people and that i think is going to be something that the region will need to reckon with in the municipalities you know that that have have this target to build homes how do we make them affordable for people uh so um so those are the top two right now. And then I think the other thing too, I will say is when we're looking at things like the services we're providing, we've got increased demands for, for supportive housing, but shelters um, and everything comes down to cost, unfortunately, you know, and resources. Oh my goodness. Now I'm going on a snowballing here, but just resources for all of this too. Um because we're going to grow, like we're slated to get to almost a million people. And I think 2041 now used to be 2050. We're growing that fast. So with that's going to come all of the services needed. It's also going to come, you know, disparities with socioeconomic and, and, and all of the things that go with, with growth um, within communities. So, but I think right now, top of mind is, is our, as our, budget and how we're paying for all of this and then how are we going to ensure we've got affordable housing and supports for people now i want to talk about budget here for a second because you're right you don't want to do it on the backs of people but you know and i know that that's the only mechanism you have right now you can increase yeah. levels of uh services whether it be at the pool or at the parks that you charge a little bit extra but they don't bring in enough money um I know FCM, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, has been calling for a new fiscal framework. They're yeah. currently meeting. But right now, until you get that new fiscal framework, you're up creek without a paddle. And yeah. municipalities are left holding the bag. What are you looking at? Because you're about to head into budget cycle here. And you're about, to, I'm assuming it's probably even started. You probably have started the yeah. process. What is the region of Waterloo and what are you looking at during this current cycle to say, OK, if we're going to get through this and if we're not going to do it on the backs, if we're going to do it not on the backs of the people, we need to look seriously at X, Y and Z to get through this process. So for you, what does it take for a regional councillor, Colleen James, to ensure that the people of the region don't get impacted as heavily as they may if the province and federal governments don't step up? Yeah, I think part of this is a serious conversation about what we're funding. Uh, currently, we are funding things that other municipalities or regions have stopped funding because the government hasn't provided funding for them. Um, there's that. And, um, you know, just even thinking about, I know one of the things that always comes up here, don't want to digress here, but even in terms of our police budget and, and the implicate the impacts of that, um, you know, it is, for me, it's really about how do we increase service, but also um, where, where are there areas where we can potentially, um, you know, I don't want to say not fun because that's not the, the, the right terminology here, but just are there areas where we can reduce um, um, or reevaluate what we're what we're funding? Um, there's there's this is this is complex though, Chris, because there's multiple levels of government who also need to be in like they need to do their part here. You know, one of the things I'm conscious of, I will say this, is that. We see bigger municipalities get bailouts around certain things, and we don't see that at the region of Waterloo. You know, um, uh, we've got increased refugee and asylum seekers here in the region. We know that there's been funds allocated for other municipalities, and we haven't seen anything here. So there's those disparities that I'm paying attention to that says, hey, we're here, but we're not. The, the situation's not being addressed. We're not receiving any help. So 
Um, now you you just got back from the AMO conference, the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, yeah. in late August. Um, they had a conference in London. Actually, I was supposed to be there. That's why I know it was in London. But you, I'm assuming, had the uh, had the opportunity to meet along with your regional counterparts, uh, with MPPs, with ministers. Did you bring these conversations up to the table and say, okay, if, we, if we're going to have a conversation, we're going to have a serious conversation? Because I've been in those conversations where they're all fluff and sometimes you go, okay, nothing really got accomplished, but you are now on the front lines and you need to make sure things get accomplished. Did you did you sort of poke the bear a bit? We're waiting. You know, <laughs> I know we did get some funding for paramedics or, uh, that, that came through. But again, those meetings are so <laughs> quick. I don't know how effective they are. And that was my first time going through on this side of things. And, uh, you know, you've got 15 minutes to get everything out, make an ask, and then it's on to the next group that's coming through. Uh, we'll see. I'll be cautiously optimistic. I'll say that. Um, but I don't, I, I, you know, I don't know if that's the right forum to have those real conversations. You need to have a meaningful conversation in more than 15 minutes. So even that probably needs to change, but we've got 444 municipalities, so I get it. Um, but I think, you know, and you said this, that, that, that framework that we use for financing, that needs to change. I mean, you look at, you know, all of you look at the municipal act you look at many of the the legislation we're bound by it is so outdated and based on models that you know maybe were relevant 50 years ago but they're absolutely not they, they can't they're not working today so you know there's some deeper conversations and and the reality is that requires work to be done uh, <laughs> You you talked about affordable housing. Now I know that uh, a lot of municipal leaders who I've speak to talk about affordable housing, and I am cautious of time, so I'm going to talk about this, and then we'll move on to my last segments because I know yeah. you're busy. Uh, affordable housing is quite important for a lot of municipalities right now. Give us a glimmer of hope that the region of Waterloo is starting on the right track or trying to figure out how to solve this crisis to get more people into homes or get them into their first homes. Yeah, you know, well, and, and I, I can't speak for the other municipalities, but what I'm hearing is that there are lots of, um, there are homes and permits, you know, a lot of people talk about the red tape. Well, there's permits that have been, you know, approved. At this point, I think, you know, municipalities are ready to to get these 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 homes built. It's a matter of developers actually putting the shovels in the ground. Uh, the other thing, too, and we know, you know, there was the GST for um, rentals. We're still looking into kind of, you know, how how that uh, will impact us in, in, in positive ways, especially with with affordable homes and rentals. Uh, but, um, yeah, you know, I think I think there's there's permits. All of those are coming through. I, again, I'm cautious to say, how do we know that something's going to be affordable? And how do you determine that? Because, um, you know, people have very good salaries and they can't afford anything. And then you've got rent evictions happening and all of the things. So, you know, I think, it, I mean, to keep it real with you too, I think part of the affordability piece with a lot of people is even getting a down payment for these homes so you know it, it's 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 multiple systems that are at play here not just the government let's say that chris i appreciate your honest answer there i i, I want to turn to my last subject because i'm like i said i'm cautious of time and i know you're busy um i want to talk about my favorite subject and it's my okay. favorite subject because i love it and i love visiting communities i love tourism I believe that municipalities and even municipalities across this country do not do a good enough job promoting themselves about why you should come visit. So as I'm about to go on another cross-country tour in uh, next year, next spring, I'm probably going to make a stop in the region of Waterloo to stop in and say hi to you. What other hidden gems should I see yeah. as a tourist spot while I'm in the region of Waterloo? Oh, my goodness. So let me just you know, give you all that I can think of 
second tier. We've got our blues frat fest. We've got our jazz fest. We've got our multicultural festival. We've got our rib fest. Um, we've got Oktoberfest. <laughs> uh arts and culture here is huge so we've got a place in in kitchener downtown called the gothel block and that is where they have art exhibits um there's live music we had an um an afro vibes festival it's it's just we've trans transformed this this st former street into basically a hub for arts and culture to, to take shape and take form um, you know, we had, what did we have last weekend? Something called Art Hop. And it was literally where art and hip hop come together. And, um, you know, we've also, at the same time, you, you think about some of the rural areas and, you know, coming up, it's, it's soon going to be, you know, um, our, our Thanksgiving, our fall, and you've got all of the, um, uh, the apple picking and, and, the different farms you can go to. I mean, I love corn from this region. So uh, that in itself, maple syrup, there's so much here. I mean, at our St. Jacob's Market, Kitchener Farmer's Market, you know, uh, this is the one of the reasons why we're pushing for more two-way all day go, especially on that weekend service, because tourism is that economic driver. And there are people who would love to be need out here, who'd love to come out here. And um, we need to ensure that we've got the transportation um, uh, to support that. Works both ways. Uh, my last question, and it's kind of the big question, and it's the biggest question I'll probably ask this entire interview, but I think you're ready for it. What makes the region of Waterloo such a unique place to live, work, and raise a family, Counselor? Oh, my goodness. You got a bit of everything, you know? The one thing, you could be in Cambridge, and you've got that that kind of very kind of European feel. You've got rivers running through it. You've got Kitchener, which is very kind of urban. Um, you've got the rural areas. You know, I grew up going on country drives, thinking that it was an hour away when really it was just 10 or 15 minutes, you know? I do that now sometimes when I need to decompress. I'll just go for a country drive and then come back. And then you've got Waterloo. I mean, there, you've got all the institutions here. Um, there's some innovative things happening. Waterloo, Laurier, Conestoga, trying to do my plug for those who listen. Um, it, you know, you've got a bit of everything and you've got a very culturally diverse community. And um, I think that's something that needs to be celebrated um, and, and that we can celebrate here is because, uh, it's a place where people want to come, clearly, when we look at our, our population growth and the investment that's happening here. Um, it's uh, it, it really is unique. And and I, I, I hope as you know, we plan for the future and that is kept in mind. You know, there is definitely things that are going to change. But also there's a you can come here in the history that is here. Um, 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 that that needs to be to be kind of fostered as well, and I think we do a good job of doing that. See horse and buggies too. I mean, you get a you get a bit of everything. <laughs> um, Councillor James, I want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for taking time out of your busy schedule and sitting down and talking. Uh, I appreciate it, and I say this with respect to all councillors who come on the show, and I think it needs to be said more often. Thank you for serving our communities. Thank you for stepping up and being part of our communities and actually making a difference, because I don't think municipal governments get uh, enough credit, and I want to change that. So Thank you for serving. Thank you for making the region of Waterloo a better place. And thank you for making Canada a better place in, in essence. So thank you. Thank you, Chris. Happy to be here and, and continue to interview us and ask us the tough and necessary questions. <laughs> <laughs> I will certainly try. I want to thank our guests for joining us today for a great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. And I want to thank you for listening or even watching this episode. Your continued support and interest in delving deep into the issues that shape our communities across Canada is both inspiring 
and essential to what we're doing here on the show. Now, as we wrap up, it is our hope that you've gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics through our guest today. Now, if you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date with the latest conversations, but you're also playing a pivotal role in supporting our endeavor to bring you more meaningful content like you saw today. Now, we couldn't embark on this journey without your support. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please consider visiting our support page linked in our show notes and on our website at crossborderinterviews.ca. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can help deliver the kind of content that you've come to expect from us. Now, once again, thank you for being part of the cross-border interviews community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.